but I guess we're um, I guess we're going live because it looks oh. like we're um, we're live. So why don't I call the meeting to order? Because I believe that we're all here. Um, it today is the Common Council Ordinance Committee regular meeting, January. Maybe I'll start over just in case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Common Council Ordinance Committee meeting is called to order on January 18th, 2022. It is 7.01, according to my clock. I'm gonna take the, um, the roll call and I see Josh Goldstein, David Hooverman, Dominique Johnson, Tom Keegan, Tom Livingston, Nora Nijowski Eichner, and Lisa Shanahan is me. So um, we're all here, we have a quorum. The first matter on um, our business calendar is the public hearing on discussing and voting on chapter 45, article two, sale and dispensing of food and drink, section 21. And this is for the, what we have been um, fondly calling the cottage food industry. So um, is there anybody who's handling our meeting tonight? Is it Larry? I don't know who. Uh, Tyler is tonight, how are oh. you? And it looks like there are two people uh, who are participating. If you would like to speak, just make sure you raise the hand. It's right by the, uh, on the bottom bar of your screen. It should say raise hand if you wanna do that. And I'll just unmute you and let you know when you can speak. Great, thanks Tyler. Cause we're at this point, if you wanna speak, we're speaking um, only to the cottage food ordinance. This is the public hearing on the cottage food ordinance. I don't see any raised hands to you, Tyler. Uh, nope, looks like we are good to continue. Okay, good. So then I'm going to close the um, public hearing on the cottage food industry, and then um, the committee now can um, see if there's any further discussion or if we're ready to vote to send this on to the Common Council. Any further conversation on the cottage food ordinance? Seeing none, I'll call the vote to um, send the Chapter 45, Article 2 to the Common Council for a vote. All in favor? It looks to be unanimous. Thank you so much. So we're gonna close that part of the discussion. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is um, open up public comment to the agenda we have this evening. Brian, I know that you have a couple of um, people to read, but perhaps Tyler, you can see if anybody um, who is on the call right now would like to raise their hand to discuss anything that's on our list of agenda topics. Okay, it looks like we have Mr. Boninfant um, requesting to speak. So if that's okay with you, Lisa, I'll just go ahead and unmute him and then he can- yes, please. Good evening, Mr. Bonifat. You should be able to speak now if you're, I think you've been can in- you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm speaking on uh, item number six under old business, discuss and vote on chapter uh, about the outdoor dining standards, okay? Um, I just wanna put in a request while you're still working on this, that you please don't allow outdoor dining in rear parking lots that border or abut residential properties, right? It's one thing to have dining on front sidewalks on, on the street, and it seems like that's what you're concentrating on, but I just, hopefully, nobody's gonna take full advantage of this because we, we had a rough summer last year, uh, our whole street, I'm on Park Hill Avenue, Richard Bonifant on Park Hill Avenue, I'm sorry, to, for the record. Um, our, our Park Hill Avenue borders Westport Avenue, and there was a restaurant there that was having all kinds of parties and loud music all, all summer long, and I, I guess they were hiding behind your, you know, temporary outdoor uh, uh, allowances or whatever it is. But I'm just saying there's a big difference between having something on the front side of the street and, you know, tables and, and, and something nice on the sidewalk, as opposed to using a rear parking lot that borders um, residential properties right there, okay? Because we had, we had a problem with that last summer. Um, I don't know where you're going with the music because I couldn't figure out that, but I hope you don't allow music if, um, that's gonna bother other people. And to say like, don't worry about it. They gotta shut it off every night at 10 o'clock. is not like a great answer. Um, that's all I'm asking you is that whenever you change the law, please consider who you might get hurt, who, who you might hurt in the process, all right? And the enforcement part, you know, make sure you got that all figured out because just to push it along and say like, hey, zoning will figure it out. Well, you know, who do you call when you have a problem in the middle of, you know, like at 12 o'clock at night when the music's blasting and loud parties are going on, you know, are you gonna call somebody at, on their cell phone at their house at, 
12 o'clock at night. Uh, anyway, you got my point and I appreciate your, your listening to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bonaparte. That is, I don't think there's anybody else on um, the call that is gonna wanna speak. So Brian, can you read whatever emails that we've gotten? Sure. Actually, sorry, excuse me. Uh, Mr. Oh, Hickey yeah. would like to- Oh, oh okay, great. Reasons. I'm sorry, have at it. Sure, sure, absolutely, go ahead. You can speak now, Mr. Hickey. We can't hear you. You can ha hear me, yes? Now we can hear you, now we can hear you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I'll try and make this short and sweet. Um, my, my main concern, I'm a restaurant owner. I own three restaurants here in Norwalk. Lifelong resident, 49 years in, in this town, my entire life. Um, the, the main concern I have is the status of the restaurant industry as we currently speak. I know that there have been tons of different rules bent and broken and changed and amended for us. And, and we're very appreciative for all of that. But I think it would be incredibly short-sighted to start to pull back on things, especially on, in, in the circumstances and, and the environment that we're in right now. Um, to, to not only start to pull back, but also go back on something that's been in place for as long as I can remember. Um, I started waiting tables almost 30 years ago on a, at a waterfront property restaurant, and we were open serving food until 11 o'clock. I'm not asking for any change in the noise ordinance, more than happy to abide by that and keep, uh, keep all the other rules and, and regulations in line. But to pull back and go to 10 o'clock would be quite detrimental, especially in our current conditions. Great. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you for coming out this evening, Mr. Hickey. Thank you. So just to double check, there's nobody else who's on, who's come, who's joined the meeting who would like to speak before we turn it over to Brian for the written communications. It looks like we are good to continue. Okay, good. Thanks, Tyler. So Brian, if you'd like to read the ones that we've received by email. Sure. Um, so the first email I received uh, was uh, Galo Elman, uh, January 17th, 2022 at 8.05 PM, restaurant hours tableau. Dear Norwalk committee members, speaking behalf of Washington Street restaurants, I think it would benefit us all if the outdoor patio closing hours would be pushed back by an hour to closing time at 11 p.m. Due to the continued pandemic, times have been special have been hard, especially now with the surge of the variants and winter. We haven't been able to have a good business season and are struggling to pay the coming bills. Having the patio closing time at 11 p.m. would allow us to allow us to have two seatings as opposed to one, making better use of our small patio due to limited seating. This way we could have a better profitable season to be able to make ends meet. Thanks so much, Galo Ailman, owner at Tableau Sono. Great, thank you. We have one more. And this one is from Matt Storch. Uh, this is sent on January 18th, 2022 at 11.35 a.m. And subject is outdoor dining ordinance, Matt Storch comments. Uh, dear committee, chairs and members, city leaders, and to all whom this may concern, thank you for taking the time to hear my thoughts regarding outdoor dining in the city of Norwalk. I believe the ambiance that we're all looking for in our small city comes to life in part by our small businesses and the outdoor dining element is a vast and crucial part of the overall feel of this lifestyle. Also a giant thank you for the ability to use city property for outdoor dining area it adds exceptional value to the businesses, business and the feel of Sono and the surrounding areas. These last few years have been a great test of what works and what doesn't. Thank you to everyone at Town Hall and this committee who have worked with us. I want, wanted to comment on one particular aspect of this proposed ordinance and its guidelines, the timing. All businesses are unique around town, just like our clientele. Some guests dine early and take in a movie or walk to the Maritime after dinner, many of our guests do it the other way around, 7 p.m. movie or painting class followed by 9 p.m. dinner and what would be more enjoyable than an alfresco dinner in Norwalk. You'd be amazed at the number of guests sitting at 8.45, 9 or even 9.30, 10 for dinner, especially on the weekends. These guests would like to eat outside and enjoy the standard two-hour dining experience many local establishments provide. We want to offer the same pre-COVID dining experience on our approved, licensed, insured patios. We would very much like to continue this service. And I believe an 11 p.m. curfew for din din diners in our outdoor spaces is a fair ask. 
When the last of our guests finish sipping their cappuccinos and taking the last bites of their chocolate cakes, our staff will be consolidate, begin consolidating the patio furniture for overnight storage, which would be after 11. If the decision comes down to an early closure because of alcohol consumption, we can always find a way to differentiate between dining guests and guests joining us for cocktails. It would be a shame to refuse someone the joy of dining on our streets after enjoying our city because they would have to finish or rush due to an unrealistic curfew. Thanks so much for your time and your continued support of small business in the fantastic city of Norwalk. Warmest regards, Matt Storch, Match Restaurant, 23 years on Washington Street. Um, just for the record, these two emails will be attached uh, to the meeting minutes uh, for January 18th, 2022. Those are the only two emails uh, that we received. That's great. And did any other um, council member of this committee receive any communication they feel that ought to be read into the record on this regard? And that looks to be a no. So I think we can now close the public comment portion of our meeting and move on to accepting of the minutes of December 21st, 2021. First, I need to thank Mr. Livingston for taking um, charge of that meeting. I appreciate very much you chairing the meeting um, when I was out of town. So um, the first question I have is, um, do we have a motion to accept the minutes? Mr. Livingston has moved, so moved. Are there any changes or amendments to the um, minutes as they appear? Mr. Livingston has some changes. Yeah, Ms. Shannon, I, I gave you, well, as well, I'll them now. Um, I'll repeat them in advance just to save us a little time, but let me just tell you what they are. Page two, uh, one, two, three, fourth paragraph, it says Chairman Livingston noted that if they are comfortable with the ordinance, I change it to be if the committee is comfortable with the ordinance. Um, down further on that page, the second, well, the last paragraph before the bullets, it says Chairman Livingston said they were just looking at the ordinance currently and they would be developed by staff. It should say they're looking at the ordinance currently and that the guidelines would be developed by the staff. On page three, um, on the, under new business, the third paragraph, under um, committee member Johnson said that she had met members of the industry and that as she understood it, I would add the word it was limited by zoning there. Okay. And then the next paragraph. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, unless Ms. Johnson wanted to change it to something else, cottage foods, but anyway. And, and then on the, the Mr. Sapienza, said that there were two limitations involving the health department. I would change that to that there were two limitations, comma, the first being the health department and the second being the zoning regulations. And that's it. Great. Does anyone else have any um, other further changes, amendments, or modifications? Seeing none, um, there's a motion on the floor to accept the minutes as now amended. All in favor? Great, and I'm going to abstain because I wasn't at the meeting. So that's um, six votes for one abstention. So we're good. All right, the next order of business is the old uh, business of discussing and voting on chapter 45, article four, uh, yeah, for outdoor dining standards and guidelines for outdoor dining. And so um, we do have Mrs. Uh, Vonacek here with us this evening. And um, we also have Brian. Just first of all, I want to um, thank the committee. Um, sometimes it's really hard to draft a very long ordinance on the floor. Um, so I was able to meet with all, all of the different committee members and get their feedback on the ordinance and then spent some time today with Jess and Brian. Um, Mr. Livingston, we took his comments today as well. So I'm gonna have Brian share the um, amended uh, again, or you know, our, our new draft of the outdoor dining, which has incorporated a lot of the comments that um, the committee members have shared over the past uh, several days. So Brian, if you wanna start kind of, we can just walk through it a little bit. Sure. Um, We've got this. This is the um, everybody has the old draft um, with that was attached to the agenda. This is the newest, latest and greatest. Right. So in forty five twenty nine under definitions, outdoor dining, um, it now says any outdoor cafe, eating area or food service establishment. Um, so you can see the cross out of cafe, sidewalk or any food service accessory to us. So it's just any cafe, eating area, or food service establishment, that would be the definition of outdoor dining. Uh, the remaining um, definitions had not changed. And um, Lisa, just, yep, go ahead, Don. Well, can I, are we going to ask comments now or go back later? I mean, make comments. 
Or we can, yeah, if you if you want, we can go over comments for each specific change as we go through. Well, the only one I want to make was on food service establishment is to propose that we delete the word stores because I don't know that really covers what we're talking about here, but that's, I don't want to get ahead of us or go out of order. Well, we'll go, we can go to that one. Does anyone have any comments on outdoor dining? I have stores highlighted, so we could talk about that next. Does, on the outdoor dining definition, does anyone have any additional comments or feedback? The only thing I would change um, in food service establishments, the last sentence, instead of the definition, it's this definition. Because other, otherwise, if you're saying the definition, the question being the definition of what? Yep. Fine. That's a good catch. Thank you, Josh. Sure. The, I only, the only question I have about stores, Tom, is don't food service providers like a restaurant they not only serve food, they also store food for use at a later time. I don't know if, you know, I mean, I don't know if it matters. I'm just quick thought. Yeah, I, I, Josh, I actually agree with you that that is, falls within the normal definition of food service establishment. Yeah. But since we're talking about, I mean, the whole purpose of this, this ordinance is to um, govern businesses that serve food to the public outside. I didn't think it was relevant here and I didn't want to get it caught up with some, somebody claims, well, I don't actually sell food to people, but I, I store it. And so therefore I ought to be covered by this. And that's not really what we're trying to get. We're trying to get establishments that serve food to the public, not that they store, I don't think. So I think this runs the risk of taking us down a path we don't want to go. If you have a, as I said, if you have a company that comes in and says, well, I store food, Therefore, I am a food service establishment. Therefore, I should be able to apply for a permit. And that's not, not what I think we're doing. All right, I see, I see that. That makes sense. Okay. All right, so the idea right now is we're going to um, delete the word stores. Yeah. Does, does anyone else have any comments about that? Okay, comfortable with that. Moving on. All right. Uh, at least it just correct me if I, if I miss one of the uh, changes that we that were talked yeah. about. Um, let's see. There are no changes that I recall in either 45, 30, A, or B. Uh, nope. C. Um, so the big next discussion is. Um, right, is right here, right? In three? Yeah, three, right. Right, so, so subsection three, um, uh, so subsection two talks about the dates in which outdoor dining is permitted April, 11, April 1, excuse me, through November 30th. Subsection three talks about uh, the, the hours when, when, a, when a business would be able to allow outdoor dining and uh, it's during, operate during re regular business hours, but no later than, and then the question is, is there a specific time? Do we want one flat time, like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock across the board? Or do we want to separate out the time based on the days of the week? Um, so as you can see here, we have, but no later than 10 p.m. Sunday through Wednesday and 11 p.m. Thursday through Saturday. That can be easily amended, but I thought it was easier to have it this way because it's easier to delete than it's, than it's to add new language. Yeah, before we um, begin that conversation, um, Tyler, would you mind um, muting Mr. Hickey as we've now left the public comment period? Uh, yeah, sure thing. Thank you very much. Okay, so opening the discussion, um, there seems to be some conversation we want to have around whether or not should there be just one period, one time period, the end of subject at which outdoor dining ends every single night, or whether we should delineate Sunday through Wednesday as a different period of time than Thursday through Saturday. Mr. Livingston, um, you're muted. Sorry, I made a comment before this meeting started about wanting to go to 10 p.m. I, I just I've just listened to the comments made by some of the, the restaurant owners. And, you know, I think as long as they're all subject to the noise ordinance, which they, which they are, you know, I guess I could live with the 11 um, throughout the full week uh, with the caveat that I think we need to think about, at least ask the question to Ms. Bonacek about what's the, what Mr. Bonif Bonifant said about um, you know, noise affecting neighbors in other contexts. Um, from, sorry, 
Yeah. Why don't you go, Jess, and then we'll take comments from the rest of the committee, just so it can inform the comments of the rest of the committee, perhaps. So yeah. I'm sorry to I'm sorry to interrupt before Jessica goes. Um, uh, Galo Ailman, I read his I read the email uh, from Galo earlier. Um, there is something in uh, the Q and A. Uh, Galo at 7:20 p.m. Uh, sent a message saying, "May I have input?" I acknowledged to, that Galo, to Galo that I read the email into the record, but I didn't. I think Galo is now on the call, so I didn't know if somebody wanted to to speak with speak to Galo's question about may he have input. You mean so? Um, actually, we could we we will suspend this conversation for purposes of him allowing to go back to public comment. Yeah. Uh, yes, I guess we can do that. That seems like a fair thing to do. Um, he has a limit of three minutes. So um, if Galo is on and he would like to speak or. Galo, are you still here? I Hello? just requested he unmute. Perfect. Hello? Galo, are you there? Yeah, there he is. All right, yes. Um, yes. We have uh, yes. a comment, um, Galo, but we're uh, making an exception so that you can make your um, comments heard. We did read your comments into the record. So if those were sufficient, we can move on. Or if you have further comments you'd like to make. Just uh, I want to uh, mention it. Uh, the whole um, purpose of having uh, this time of 11 p.m. is because, you know, uh, like I uh, said before, you know, just in this COVID time, it's hard for all of us, you know, just literally to survive. So I want to make sure and, and emphasize that we need those hours, not because, you know, just for the sake of uh, having it, just, you know, financially stuff for us. And the only way we can make up all of this time loss is is having um, these um, these hours extended. So please take in consideration that because you know just we are not the only ones. I think the majority of the business on the street are are going through that. So just we want to make sure uh, you all all of you guys understand that you know in the business perspective you know is a lot of a lot of uh, uh, people are involved in our business families and everything. The only way we can survive this is, you know, just being open and, uh, you know, just we don't have the luxury to have a patio. We rely on a sidewalk, uh, you know, just have regular dining helps outside. But, you know, just the more hours we, we are there, you know, it's going to it's going to be better. Unfortunately, we have like I said, we have a tiny little patio. And that literally that's our main dining room in the spring, in the summer. So for all this time loss, you know, we have to catch up and just make a, you know, make a good uh, thing of, of, of this ordinance. So if you guys help us doing that, I will really appreciate it. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much for making the comments. And what we're going to do you, now Dana. is we're going to, we appreciate you coming. Um, Tyler, if you could mute Mr. Alman, that would be great. We'll go back to um, Jess, who was going to comment on the um, hours. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you, Gayla. Yeah, of course. Um, so the from what we're hearing from the restaurants um, that have weighed in um, beyond even the public comment is at 11 o'clock. It sounds like the right number to them. A lot of the um, kitchens close at either 1030 or 11 o'clock. So they're thinking that if they could get a second turnover for the tables, that would be helpful. And um, as Matt Storch had mentioned, they're generally seeing, um, especially in the warmer weather, people sitting down um, around 930 for an hour and a half um, seating. So that is in general um, what I've heard about the hour itself. Um, regarding Mr. Belafonte's um, comment, I think that relates to, and I would need more detail, but my sense is that that relates to the allowance through the executive order and also the piece of legislation that was passed that, um, that lifted the zoning requirement for parking for restaurants. So what ended up happening with a lot of restaurants where they were using their actual parking lot for outdoor dining as they had no need for to um, offer the required parking through zoning. So I don't, um, in this particular ordinance, the way that we've worked through it, that actually was the one element from the executive order and the one element from the piece of legislation that was passed that we did not propose for this particular ordinance. So that language would, um, 
the, the fact that the language is not in this ordinance would address that. Okay, great. I think, Nora, you had your hand up. Do you still have a comment now that you've heard Jess's ex explanation? Um, yes, and thank you, Jess, I appreciate that. Um, I just had two very quick comments. Um, one is to say that I did appreciate Mr. Bonifant's point about having a clear point of contact for people who have complaints. Um, and I think this is something we had discussed, um, potentially Lisa as well, that again, that would be appropriate in the guidelines and not the ordinance, but to flag that I do think that's something that should really be considered for the guidelines. Because quite frankly, not everyone wants to make a police call about it and, quite, and the police may not be the ones to bother. But um, particularly since the ordinance does allow consideration of history of violations, it would be really useful for there to be a clear way for the neighbors to know who to contact to sort of build that history of violations. Um, and the second point, um, in terms of the time, um, I actually do recognize the value of a, of a 10 o'clock on a Sunday through Wednesday versus an 11 o'clock for the weekends. I do feel like that may be a respectful balance point for neighbors versus the needs of the restaurants. And I would be sort of curious, um, I would think that it would be very likely that at the earlier days of the week, they're less likely to have people later. Um, but in general, I'm also comfortable with going to 11 if that's where the committee lands. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, we do have a need to support local businesses in this community. And I think we've heard very strongly from folks that having the ability to do two turnovers is a significant economic boon that is worth considering. So thank you very much. Great. Does anyone else have a comment? I can't really see everybody yeah. in the comic strip. So um, is yeah, that I do. Much? Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Brian, would you mind just stop sharing this? For some reason, it was like the boxes kept flipping and it was like really trippy there for a second. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to repeat what other people have said. I mean, I think what Nora and Tom made some very good points. A couple things I just want to mention. First of all, the pre, everyone who we heard from in public comment all ha, are restaurant owners that have restaurants on Washington Street. And I mean, I live three blocks away from Washington Street in terms of um, you know the the, the the noise issue and sort of the turnover. I don't see a problem, especially on Washington Street, going to eleven o'clock. The only thing I don't know from the comments from all three of them, and clearly there seems to be an effort among especially the Washington Street restaurants to lobby to 11, is whether they meant 11 o'clock every day of the week or 11 o'clock during sort of the way the noise ordinance, uh, you know, captures it in terms of like the weekend period and like the week period. Um, the only thing I'd mention, and, and I think the way maybe to try and, you know, essentially cut a compromise here from what, Rich, you know, Rich Bonifaz's valid point. I'm looking at the guidelines where it talks specifically about the Washington Street Design District and how the hours are that sort of split week sort of thing that we have that we're talking about. I, I do wonder if we need to implement similar language in the ordinance based on location because that two turnover situation is most prevalent, I would imagine, both in Washington Street, of course, and Wall Street more secondarily. So I guess my question is whether we need to do it by location or do we just flatly say, you know, 11 o'clock in, in the way we have done it, they're already in the guidelines. So I guess my question, Jess, in your conversations with, uh, 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 with the restaurateurs, and I assume it's not just restaurateurs on Washington Street, um, is whether that 11 o'clock is nuanced or whether if it's a blanket request. So um, they, the restaurants that I spoke to didn't designate 11 o'clock for weekend or weekday. They just said 11 o'clock would be very helpful given the closing of the kitchen time. So that's one. Um, second of all, I think that you um, are right in the sense of that the, a large majority of our restaurants and outdoor dining um, is on Washington and in Wall Street West Ave, but I don't necessarily see a challenge or I don't really see the need to be able to start designating geographic delineations for certain times and certain ways in which we want to limit or allow. So I think that, you know, if I was to make a recommendation in my opinion, and it's up to the committee, obviously, but it's sort of, I don't think that we want to get into geographic designations and start to pick and choose different times based on what those geographies look like. Yeah. And by the way, I don't want to make it unnecessarily complicated. That's not what I'm trying to do. I just know that the guidelines are already there. I mean, they're already doing it. 
Um, and I realize that the guideline isn't the same legal function as an ordinance, but um, you know, I, I do think, um, I mean, I personally, you know, the 11 o'clock issue to me, especially on a weekend, I understand, I think it's less likely that you're going to have as much noise coming from during, you know, on a Wednesday night at 11, but I'd be interested to hear whatever else's views are on this too. I think Mr. Livingston had his hand up first, then Mr. Huberman, and then Mr. Keegan. Yeah, just, that order. So Mr. Yeah, just quick, just, just quickly, because I know I've spoken before. I, I, I got comfortable with the 11 o'clock because we have the nor noise ordinance. So I don't think we need to have different la uh, uh, different language for different districts in this ordinance. And in fact, I, I think because it's covered in the noise ordinance, as long as everybody understands, I mean, in theory, you could be open till three, but you're still subject to the noise ordinance. So, you know, if, if people start complaining, if you're, if you're noisy after 10 o'clock on Washington Street on a Monday, or you're noisy in another neighborhood, I think you're covered. I don't think you need to, to worry about it. Yeah, and we're gonna come into that in a minute because when we get to number four, you'll see how we um, we tag that. Um, Mr. Hooverman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the Jess, have the, have, since we spoke the last time, have the guidelines, have you gone in and rejiggered the guidelines and worked on them? So we have not done that because we knew that the ordinance was going to change several times. So instead of losing track of guidelines and standards, we doubled down on working with Lisa and Brian on the ordinance so that we could get that solidified because the guidance okay. and standards is really going to be built off the ordinance. So what I had said to Lisa earlier today was that um, we will be sure after today's discussion, when we get more on the same page to be able to update guidelines and standards so you can have a look at them. But we really didn't want to, we didn't want to get lost in the guidelines and standards um, by losing iterations. Great. That's kind of what I thought. And I think that sort of that helps with uh, what Mr. Goldstein was saying. Also, I think that you know, when we come up with what this is, the guidelines will reflect that. Speaking to that, my my thing is, I I like the, I'm not necessarily always a proponent of one size fits all, but I think that from a simplicity standpoint, having an 11 o'clock stop time creates a better ease of enforcement. This way, all of the, you know, the police officers are going to get these phone calls. They know what the time is. It's, it's, a, it's standard. It's not, oh, we're on this street. What is the, this time? And we get it wrong. I, I, think it'll, I think it'll just, it'll make the, the process a little simpler from an enforcement standpoint. And, and I appreciate that. And also, from the restaurateur standpoint, I, I think giving them the ability to have that extra turn right now is, is important. So... Great. Thank you, Mr. I think that I think the challenges that we were seeing during COVID with the barriers was more of the one o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock morning time period. And I think that what was happening was that as the restaurants, when the restaurants were 25%, 50% capacity, that was one thing. But when the restaurants were 100% capacity and the barriers were up, everyone was leaving the restaurants all at one time and the restaurants were all at 100% capacity. So, and the barrier was in place. So that's when you started to get a lot of the folks that standing outside the restaurants and not moving. And so if we think about it this time, we're not going to have the barriers, but we also, you know, we'll limit outdoor dining till 11. And so that challenge and that problem isn't going to be as dominant or as present, I think, as it is now. The other piece um, was with the barriers, uh, the police department was having a hard time enforcing because they didn't necessarily want to go over the barrier into the crowds of people. So as again, the barriers will not be there. So I think we're going to alleviate a lot of those challenges and a lot of the problems that we did see but they were more at one and two and three in the morning as opposed to 11 o'clock in the evening when people were just finishing dinner. So um, that's the comment there. And then I think my other comment is that I agree with you um, that from a police enforcement standpoint, you know, I'm kind of picturing them walking at 10 o'clock to make sure all the dining is in and then walking at 11 o'clock to make sure that the ordinance is being abided by. So I think you know, I know that the two are independent and I know that they need to be enforced independently, but at the same time, I think it might help to be able to align those times just to be able to, 
you know, have the police walk, um, walk the streets at one time and know that they're sort of looking for multiple things at one time. I think it might be helpful. Thanks, Jessica. Speaking of that, Mr. Keegan had his raise, his hand raised. Yeah, hi, thanks, uh, Lisa. I, I was gonna say the same thing, that this is really two separate issues. And I think we're trying to meld them. If I was dining at 11 o'clock, you would never even hear me, but that's me. So uh, I don't think that uh, necessarily someone dining at 11 o'clock means an abundance of noise. So the one thing I do wanna um, share is with, I think Brian would know this. Brian, where do we stand with noise meters? Um, I know that the police have gone through their training. I believe it was in August of last year uh, with Mr. Eric Swirling from Rutgers. I don't know how many noise meters they have. Um, I could follow up and, and certainly get you guys an answer very quickly. I'll just email the uh, Deputy Chief Zaka about that. Um, the, the other uh, thing that I wanted to mention briefly is, is that um, this is not only about noise, it's about, uh, you know, and you're going to see this later on in the ordinance, um, it's about, you know, being a good, a good neighbor, whether you're uh, a restaurateur or um, one of the people that, you know, happen to live around there. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're getting a permit uh, to do this. If you violate what we're telling you to do, then you risk the, the risk, the, the, the possibility of losing that permit. And it could be for a multitude of things. One thing is the noise ordinance, uh, but another thing is not closing up when we tell you to close up. Uh, I think it's a pretty black and white issue as to whether you're um, whether you're still eating after 11 p.m. or not. Um, and so I would think that, you know, all these all the businesses that are saying that they need the business would also want to keep their permit uh, because there is the opportunity. Number one, later on in enforcement to go back to what Rich Bonifant said. Number one, you can lose the permit if you you know violate the trust that the ordinance committee and, and the common council is giving you. Number one. And number two, you might not have that permit next year either if you're considered to be a bad actor. And we want to help. The whole purpose of this is to help the businesses, the restaurants, and we want them to be good neighbors as well. So it's kind of, a, like you said, a balancing act. So there's those, those issues. And I will get back to you about the amount of noise meters we have. Can I take a sense of the committee right now? Oh, Dominique, you go ahead. Ms. Johnson. Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, if that's all right, but unless you need to take a quick no, stroll. No, 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 I was going to take a sense of the committee, but I'd like to hear it. I'd like to oh, do that after your good. comment. Well, my, my comment kind of picks up um, Mr. Candela's point that was first presented by Mr. Bonifant. I'm just thinking as a, like the guidelines will be specifics for these business owners. And I know they're still in drafting, you know, they're still in, in the drafting stage, but um, let's say that there is, a restaurant that is using a back patio, is that technically gonna be permitted or are we just being very specific about it can only be on the sidewalk? Cause that's the part that's still amorphous to me. Well, if they, if they, own, the, if they own the patio, if they own the back thing, that's their own real property, which is discussed right. in the ordinance. It's another thing if you're on Washington street, right? And you're using the sidewalk, which is city property, right, Brian? Oh, you're on mute, Brian. Yeah, give me one second. The way that the ordinance is written, the way that we wrote, the way that the ordinance is, is framed now is that you can use your front patio, but you can also use a rear patio. So to Josh's point, if you own the land at the back and you were to apply for a permit, you would include the back area of your restaurant on the permit. Um, and you and that would have to go through all of the same guidelines and standards as what you would have to go through on the street side. So okay. we the way in which the language originally read was that um, the outdoor dining was allowed adjacent to the storefront. So at the front, but the way in which we um, wrote the language in the ordinance currently is that they can be at the front and they can also be at the back. Now, I think, um, again, the public comment, I think refers to more that a parking lot was cordoned off and that the parking lot was then used as the patio, which would not be granted in this particular. That's not um, permittable. Okay, yeah. that's a good clarification. I know with the music, um, like everything, it would have to be within the ordinance parameters 
you know, so as long as the music wasn't too loud, that's permissible as well, up until the noise ordinance would kick in, I imagine. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Lieberman, you have one more Thank comment? You. Yeah, just oh, well, 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 sorry, one second, it. David, one David, one second, sorry. The noise, just, 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 for clar just for clarification, the noise ordinance is always in effect, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, the difference is whether it's daytime or nighttime hours, there's always a decibel reading that you have to satisfy in the city of Norwalk. Daytime hours are more flexible. It gives the people, the restaurateurs of people a little bit more noise that they can make before they're violating it. Uh, at nighttime, it lo that, that, uh, that lowers it. So. Um, whether you're at 10 p.m. or 11 p.m., whatever the, the ordinance committee decides to go forward with, um, you always have to be um, you always have to be in line with what the uh, noise ordinance says. Um, so, for example, Washington Street is different than the rest of the city of Norwalk. Uh, daytime hours for the city of Norwalk, absent Washington Street, is 8 p.m. That's when daytime hours ends. That's when nighttime hours uh, begin. So, if you're a restaurant outside of Washington Street. Nighttime hours for decibel levels begin at 8 p.m. Uh, if you're on Washington Street, it varies. It goes anywhere from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. I believe 10 p.m. is earlier in the week. I believe 11 p.m. is on Thursday. And after that, between, I think, Friday and Saturday night, I believe it's 1 a.m. before it turns to nighttime hours, if I'm correct. It's in Chapter 68. But the, the noise ordinance is always in effect 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Great. Great. So now I'll take Mr. Huvelman's comment and then I'm going to ask for a sense of the committee for 10 or 11. Well, I'm, I'm all for 11. The, 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 this begs, brings an interesting question though, if a business owner owns real property in the back where they have a parking lot, they can lose square footage of that parking lot and still have enough parking to satisfy the zoning requirements. Can they not do that? Can they not apply for a permit? It's their property. If they satisfy the requirement for parking, then they have the ability to use the rear. Then they well, do. We've, okay. They do. Yeah. So we need them to meet their zoning requirement, but in some cases they have beyond what they need for zoning. And in that case, we would allow them to apply for a permit. And if they followed the guidelines and standards, we would allow them to be able to use that. And they so have I a, think front, a front patio that they own that is real property. They need a permit to have dining on that patio that they own. Yes, they need to be that's... able to. Okay. Yeah. So the so there are some restaurants that have gone through the zoning process that where their site plan includes um, a restaurant or excuse me, outdoor dining. Okay, so they still need to notify the city that they're doing outdoor dining. They're already permitted because they went through the site plan process and they went through the zoning process to begin with. Okay. But we still require them to go through um, the process of permitting so that we understand that they are using their outdoor dining facility and that we know that that's an activated space. Okay, thank you. I, I, I appreciate that clarity. Good. Thanks. So just to get a sense of the committee, um, are we going to go with the 11 o'clock um, let's see, show, show of hands. We're okay with 11 o'clock. Okay, great. Moving on. So Brian, can we go on to the next section, which is four? We made some changes there. Thanks everybody. So if you want to just change that language, uh, Brian, to say, but no later than 11 PM on in three, we'll fix that. And then we can go to four and tell people where we are on that. Um, Okay, so four, we just, we kind of cleaned up to make it a little clearer about what the planning and so, zoning, yeah. Yeah, so this, this is um, what I was, what I was getting at is, is that, um, you know, this is, this is kind of to try and, you know, in terms of the balance, we're giving people 11 p.m., uh, but there's also, you know, caveats to how you use your outdoor dining. Um, and so what we're trying, what we're trying to show here is, uh, to all sides is that you have to be a good actor. You have to be a good neighbor. Um, your permit could be denied or declined uh, to renew or revoked. So we can deny it, we can decline to renew it, or we can revoke it um, if you violate the outdoor dining um, requirements of this chapter, the outdoor dining guidelines and standards, which will be finalized uh, after tonight's meeting, or the terms of any permit issued pursuant thereto. Uh, subsection two fails to correct any such violation when duly noticed. So somebody makes a complaint, you know, of whatever it might be, 
you know, you, you left something out too late or, or whatever it might be and you don't fix it, that is a violation. Um, three is delinquent in taxes owed to the city and or has two or more violations of any provision of the Norwalk City Code, and code excuse me, including without limitation, chapter 68 noise within two years immediately preceding the filing of the permit. So what we're trying to show here is, is that, um, you know, you have to be a good neighbor and there are ways that as a business, you want to you want to follow the rules that we're giving you so that you have the, the the benefit of 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 you know getting this extra business but you have to follow the rules and these are the way some of these are the ways in which you can lose the permit or not have it renewed or, or you can have it revoked if you don't follow these these uh these things that we've enumerated in number four exactly and what we're trying to emphasize is that the noise ordinance is particularly important in this regard so we're trying to reassure the public that this is definitely an important thing so maybe we can move on then, Brian, to um, our next big change. Can I just ask one quick question first? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, duly noticed. Um, I guess since this is a public hearing, you know, and the public is listening, how do people get duly noticed? Like, do we need to spell that out or do they just know? I like, is it the well, city? Like, how does the city inform them? Yeah, I think it'll be picked up in the guidelines about whether or not, because they might get duly noticed by the police, they might get duly noticed because somebody, as um, uh, Nora pointed out, some people may not want to call the police on them. They may want to make a complaint with the zoning officer. I, I, we can pick that up in the guidelines. When you say, Jess, how would you best address? Yeah, so I think, um, so it's a definitely a conversation that we had, but this does relate to fire department, police department, health department, zoning department. So um, each department has their own process of um, notifying based on a violation. And um, that is then dictated through the ordinance or through the statute in which the, in which the ordinance basically spells that out. So for example, um, Brian and I were talking earlier today about streets and sidewalks and people um, shoveling or not shoveling um, and icy sidewalks and so on and so forth. So in um, the street and sidewalks ordinance, there's actually a reference to what the violation is and how the violation needs to be made. So we would be depending on each of the different departments to be able to use their guidelines and processes to be able to notify based on the violation. Great, Mr. Livingston, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm just struggling a little bit here. If we have a restaurant that already has a permit, is complying with its, its the guidelines, and that's the question I understand, but it violates the noise ordinance continually. Does this give us the power to revoke it? The permit, because if you look at this, um, four says has had two or more violations of any provision, including noise, within the two years immediately preceding the filing of the permit. So that would not cover somebody who's operating now and continually violates the noise ordinance. Wouldn't that be covered in the number one where it's violated? That, that's that's the my question. I, I think that might be the answer, Jess. Uh, um, are, are the standards going to say comply with all applicable city code? I mean, I, I assume yeah. it will. Okay. If that's the case, yeah. I think that that works. I just want to make sure we, we think about that. We're going to have to write that. And we're also going to have to be duplicative on the hours, right? So we're going to talk about location and we're going to talk about operations. And so some of it is going to be duplicative with the ordinance. And I think that definitely is one of them. Okay. Well, certainly because we want to the noise. The idea would be that if you continuously use your patio past 11 o'clock or you continuously have noise violations that we then as the city have the ability to revoke the permit that we had um, granted as part of the outdoor dining process, right? That would be my, that in my mind from an administrative standpoint, that's how I'm reading this. Me too. So the guidelines will be very clear about how different, um, like the police, the fire and citizens may reach out to make complaints that will be adjudicated by you or collected by you, counted by you. Yeah. The, way, the, flip side of, the flip side of that is also how 
the restaurants are notified so we don't run into an issue where a restaurant says, I was never notified of a violation. Because well, like we didn't the, tell them or something. One of the ways to do that is to ensure that when a violation is being made to a restaurant that has outdoor dining, that zoning and planning is being copied on the violation notice. Yeah. As long as it's in writing, I think you're fine. I think that's the end story there. Yeah. Well, the other thing too, I think is that um, for us to be able to do a two year look back or two years immediately preceding the filing of the permit, we're gonna have to be copying on all of the violations because we really need to either one way to do it is to, for each violation that goes out, we keep track. The other is that we survey the departments um, for every permit that comes in to see if there's been a violation on the property. But to be able to meet um, number four, we're gonna have to be able to pull that information each time a permit application comes in. Right, well, you need to do it because um, first of all, we, they, their first mistake is a warning, their second mistake is a fine, and then they're, you know, go from there. So there has to be in the guidelines, something that the departments, the fire department, the police department and others are told that this is how you reach out because otherwise the penalty section doesn't work. No, absolutely. And I think the other piece with the, the other piece is some education on the public side of the house, which is that the noise if there's a noise issue, it goes to the police department because it needs to be dealt with in the moment in time. And sometimes what we end up seeing is that um, uh, someone who has experienced a noise issue calls the next day at eight o'clock in the morning to say that they had a noise issue the night before, but we're unable as a city to be able to go out and actively correct that because it's not the moment in time. So that's really why the police department is the, well, the police department is the enforcer because they are the department that has the resources to be able to do that. But in addition to that, it also is really important for them to contact the police department because they're the folks that are resourced at that particular point in time in the evening to be able to go and deal with the issue at hand. Exactly. Mr. Hooverman, you've got a comment and then we'll move on. Well, yeah, this enforcement um, or the, the permitting thing, the question I have now is what you talk about a, a a, a restaurant that has the their outdoor dining space baked into their zoning already because it was part of their their original site plan. Mm -hmm. How how does this work then prohibiting them who have violations? Because they you, they're not applying for a permit every year. They're not applying for a permit every year. So we would. I mean, it's a good it's a good catch in the sense that we haven't come across that issue. So and we haven't I'm gonna throw, experienced I'm gonna throw another issue out. Somebody who yep. has outdoor dining in the front and the back, do they only lose the privilege of one because the violations maintained to one? Do they lose the privilege across the board? So for me on the second question, they would lose the privilege across the board because mm -hmm. they're not, they're not acting as they should. And they're not under, they're not following the guidelines and the standards. The first question I think is more complicated and I'm unclear. I don't know the answer. I, I would need to visit planning and zoning and I would need to work with Brian to figure out what the answer is for that. Um, it also begs how within the ordinance, how we're able to address that as well or whether we need to address that with any specificity. Well, does this ordinance actually apply to that? Because they are separately permitted. They are. Um, so so let me necessarily address that. Yeah, let me look into it with planning and zoning and get back to this group on that. There are very few examples where the site plan process approved the actual patio. So one example is Oak and Almond on Maine, where the patio is really incorporated almost into the restaurant footprint. Um, but in that particular, you know, as I said, in those particular cases, we haven't had, in my understanding, we haven't had violations happen in those particular places. But I think it's a really good point. And it's one that I didn't think of. So I need to visit with p and and also Brian to be able to come up with a, a meaningful answer for you. I don't want to come up with an, an answer on the fly that we don't feel is correct internally. Well, we have time to address this because our next meeting will be um, taking this to public hearing so um, we can address it in the month 
in between. So moving forward. So um, Nora, you go next and then Tom. Keegan. Extremely short. I just realized that on four, there are two ors in that first sentence because we added the or revoke a permit. So I would simply convert that first or there between permit and decline to a comma. Gotcha. Yes, thank you. We hate extra ors, <laughs> Mr. Keegan. Heaven forbid. Correct. Unless you were in a boat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just just to give a little um, prior experience and uh, to allay Mr. Yuvelman's concerns, the police have a lot of tools in their toolbox, okay? And one of the things that we had to do in the town of Greenwich was go after a restaurant's liquor license. And the police have that um, ability. If, if you are a nuisance to the community, then... Uh, a liquor commission can take away your liquor license. And that'll probably shut your restaurant down for a while. So there are things that can be done, not necessarily through zoning, but through other methods. Thank you for reminding of that, uh, Mr. Keegan. That's a good point. All right, let's move on, keep moving because we still have other business tonight, which will take up time. Um, I know we're sort of skimming through our next 3531 uh, subsection B, we just switched the, uh, the, the language. Uh, it's still the same, but it, said it, it says, including city property, uh, a food service establishment shall be responsible for keeping the outdoor dining premises, including city property, clean at all times. We had just switched city property before clean at all times. Yep. And we uh, also made it a, um, its own section. That's why the, um, the numeration right. is different. Correct. Um, I think everything else is pretty straightforward um so when we talk about the fines and revocation um jessica you'll see why we were saying that you know we do need to find a way to enumerate what number of fences is for purposes of the mm -hmm. um, penalties and you know written warning uh it could be uh, a police officer writing a ticket it could be a fire marshal citing you for something it could be planning and zoning, doing something like that, or it could just be an email from whoever uh, the enforcement agent is uh, who received the uh, the complaint uh, from the pol who received the document from the police or whatever. It could be a follow up email, you know, just for, for our system so that we have it in there. Uh, but it will be a written warning because we need obviously proof of uh, notice to the uh, offending restaurant that they did something wrong. Great. So. In general, that are those are the um, updated changes that we had as we started thinking about it and took the feedback from all of our committee members over the weekend. Is there further discussion about this or what I'd like to do is vote to take this to public hearing at our next meeting, um, subject to Jess can get back to um, the committee about the um, enforcement uh, question that Mr. Hooverman asked about um, restaurants that already have a baked in patio. Mr. Mm -hmm. um, Livingston. Yeah, I just want to make that motion. Uh, to move. move Thank you here. very much. Um, any further discussion or shall we take the vote? Looks like discussion is closed. So um, all of those who um, are in favor of discuss of uh, voting chapter 45, article four, outdoor dining standards and guidelines for outdoor dining forward. Um, it looks like it's a unanimous vote. We'll take it to, pub to uh, public hearing next month. Thank you very much. It's a really long discussion. Thank you very much, for everybody, for um, giving us the extra time to go through this. It's a really important uh, measure that we're doing, especially for our small businesses in Norwalk. We can see how important it is to the restaurateur. So really appreciate the time and effort everybody put in on this, especially you, Jess, who's been doing this. I think we've been talking about this for a year. <laughs> thank you to Jessica. Thank you to Jessica. And thank you for Bill for both staying on. Yes. Thank you for all your hard work. Yeah, no. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. I wouldn't be able to do it without you. So thank you so much. Thanks, well, we everyone. We appreciate it very much. Okay. So we'll we'll see you next month on this, but um, we'll wait for that answer on that one question. Okay. You got new it. We'll follow up. <laughs> thank you. New business. And this is an interesting conversation. Discuss and vote on temporary prohibition of all cannabis establishments. So as we, um, and Nick is with us, so he'll um, he's going to guide us through this conversation. But where we are is the state of Connecticut has um, put in some new legislation about um, retail establishments on cannabis. And so at this time, um, we are suggesting that uh, the city of Norwalk put a temporary prohibition on cannabis establishments for the time being so that we can go out, do the research, understand um, what the state 
law says and um, what the various um, really issues are for us to consider. So Nick, if you're here with us, we were hoping you would walk us through this, the state law and um, some of the decisions the city of Norwalk has to address. Sure, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for giving us up um, your evening. Yeah, of course, um, not a problem. So, um, I mean, I can sort of give the 30,000 foot view on, on this one. Um, you guys have it right here in front of you, the actual draft prohibition. Um, I'll just quickly say, this is um, the language that you have in front of you, which um, if the, the full council acted favorably on, obviously would become a town ordinance as opposed to a zoning regulation. Um, which the new law does allow us to do either or, but for purposes of um, this temporary ban, so to speak, um, it, you get there through an ordinance just as well as you would um, if you're couching it as a zoning regulation. And um, like I said, you have it right there in front of you. It's, there, there isn't all that much to it. Um, and this is similar, Brian, had reached out to me and asked for um, some input. We've used um, a number of the towns that my firm represents um, have used this language um, across the board for similar um, prohibitions. Some have been temporary, some have not been, um, but it uses, we've used more or less the same language here. And the end result um, is that for nine months, which I see you guys have here, there is, no cannabis establishments that can operate anywhere in town, period. Um, I say Nick, cannabis Nick, establishment. Nick, I, I kind of want you to go a little bit in a different direction at the beginning, because I, I think we're, we can talk about what this does. But I'm kind of hoping that you would give us a sense of what the state of Connecticut is permitting and why this might be a good idea to do. And some of the decisions that the city of Norwalk is going to have to make about where these establishments go in and things like that. Can you give us like the 30,000 feet first? And then we can talk about why it's a good idea to do the, the yeah, sure, operation. sure. That'd be great. Um, That'd be so helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So um, we saw this new legislation passed on, um, it became effective in July, July 1st of this um, past year, 2021. Um, as of July 1st, um, recreational adult use of cannabis is allowed. Um, so there's no law in Connecticut, at least, that says um, recreational consumption is prohibited. Um, but there's some other pieces that go along with that. Um, obviously, the legislation also granted to municipalities here in Connecticut the authority to regulate what this new business landscape um, might look like. And this new business landscape involves 11 different types of business categories that fall under this umbrella of um, recreational cannabis. I referred to them earlier and you see it here in your, your draft prohibition as cannabis establishment. And um, they, they run the gamut from your entry sort of step one um, producers and growers to actual um, retail facilities um, to things like product packagers and even um, transporters. Um, I will say, just because I mentioned transporters, this prohibition would not um, block the transport, for instance, from another town um, to then deliver within Norwalk, um, but it would stop any of these different business establishments from being able to set up shop and operate. And I, I think um, the intention of the legislature here was to um, sort of see the writing on the wall and a trend that some of the Connecticut populace is heading towards legalization of cannabis, just like we're seeing across the nation. Um, obviously for some social implications there, but also because there's some real fiscal benefits that can come from this. Um, I, I'll just quickly say the benefits for municipalities would be um, the tax, the potential tax revenues. And what I mean by that is um, 
any sale of cannabis um, that would take place within the city limits, there would be a 3% municipal sales tax. Um, that's in addition to the state 6.35% or whatever it is, sales tax. Um, so that 3% sales tax would be administered through um, the Department of Revenue Services, but that would ultimately get kicked back to the town, or I'm sorry, the city. There are some caveats to how the city would be able to use those funds, um, which track sort of with um, this whole landscape. So just a, a couple of um, uses a, as an example, streetscape improvements and some neighborhood developments in communities where cannabis retailers are located, um, educational programs, um, services for individuals in the city who are released from Department of Corrections, mental health stuff. So um, we, we get this, the, this tax revenue source, um, but we sort of have to use it to um, better our residents and our communities as it might relate to um, recreational cannabis. So um, I don't know, Madam Chair, if, if you have any more specific questions. I I've mean, got there's... a couple. I do. Yeah, so sure. one of the um, questions I had was, I think that, um, and you'll remind me because I don't remember the numbers specifically, but that you're allowed to have a certain number of retail establishments per, is it 15,000 in population? And 25,000. 25, 25,000. Right. So the city of Norwalk could have three or four because we're at 90,000. Um, that would be three. Three. Okay. So you have to, so you up to 25,000 for each of the counts. Okay. Correct. That's the question. And then are there some rules about where they can exist or can the municipal, does the municipality have full um, decisions about where to place these types of organizations or retail establishments? Yes. So that there are no um, for example, proximity limitations or really any types of location or other regulatory aspects um, under the, the legislation that we have on the books right now. Um, that authority has been granted to the local municipalities. And um, although we are just doing, or at least on the table right now, is a proposed blanket prohibition, um, the, the city does have the authority to create more robust um, regulations that would go along with the anticipated operation at some time of these types of establishments. And it doesn't have to be all of these 11 categories. The, the city can restrict um, which of these establishments it's going to allow to operate within city limits. Um, we can set certain proximity limitations to things like schools, churches, whatever. Um, we can set up, and, and my thought process um, in discussing this with other municipalities who are taking a temporary prohibition right now, is that this more robust set of regulations that I'm describing um, probably would be best served as a zoning regulation. Um, that is. It, 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 I mean, some of the things I would be thinking about when it comes to regulating this type of business operation seem to track with what we do um, with zoning regulations. Um, that being said, though, the, the legislation um, that is in effect right now allows us to regulate this process either through zoning regulations or by local ordinance. So, it's, it's sort of an even or, but we do have some relatively broad discretion um, as to those more robust set of regulations. And um, within um, more specific regs, we can set out a, um, an actual special permit review process whereby any of these establishments would have to make some affirmative um, application to, for example, the zoning commission. So they would have to go in front of the commission. They would have to have a public hearing and be um, approved for an actual permit before um, they could just set up shop. I mean, these, this is one of the things I'm sort of conceptualizing um, for municipalities that are trying to build this out a little bit um, more specifically down the road. 
That's great. And I, I should be, um, say the committee, because we've had this conversation with all of the committee members that we're putting this temporary um, block in right now so that we can take the time to fully realize what we think ought to be the Norwalk facing uh, pro program that we might have. Are there other questions that um, committee members might like to ask of Nora? I see your hand up first. Just two very quick um, questions. One is, um, is there a date by when, what, what is the timeline that we need to be concerned about here? When does the state allow retail establishments to start being operated? So that is a bit of a fuzzy question and there isn't a very solid answer I can give you. Um, the, the sooner the better is what I've been telling people because I, I've heard, I mean, it depends on who you talk to at the governor's office. Um, I have heard some whisperings that for um, some of these applicants who you might have heard the term thrown around social equity applicants, um, there's, there's certain um, uh, anticipated business owners or business proprietors who are trying to get into this new market space who are eligible to um, cut the line, basically. And, and they get their first shot. Um, they would be the first ones to receive some sort of licensing from the state. And I had heard some whisperings that that could start happening as early as um, the springtime this year. Maybe not. Um, we, we hear other things that, yeah, actually, that's not going to be more until later in this year. But um, the risk is if we do nothing, um, these establishments would be treated just as any other retail establishment. So there would be nothing that would prevent them from once they have their state approval in hand from just setting up a storefront here in town um, where a, a, a retail type commercial um, establishment would otherwise be permitted under our, our zoning regs. So um, the short answer is there's no hard date, but I think the sooner the better to avoid that um, potential conflict with somebody trying to sneak in, essentially. Great, thank you. And, and one other just very quick question. So you mentioned limits on the number of retail establishments. Are there statutory limits on the types of other establishments? Um, no, the only two where there's that sort of cap per 25,000 is... Um, there's only one retailer and one, there's this other category called a micro cultivator. Um, those are the only two that are specifically called out. You can only have one of those for every 25,000 residents. Great, are you all set, Nora? Do you have other questions? No, thank you very much, Nick. Okay, sure. Luke, Josh, you're next and then um, uh, Ms. Johnson. Uh, very quickly, you said there were other cities that were considering the same kind of temporary prohibition. How, like, how many? Like, what are we talking about? Are we part of a minority of state cities that are doing this, or is this sort of the general consensus across the state? In yeah, I'd, I'd say it, it. It's it's very much um, the general consensus across the state. I I think I could probably call out if I did a little digging or looked at some of my notes. Um, it's either you count on one hand, maybe two hands, the number of municipalities that are actually going the other direction. So some aren't, um, some are doing the ban, but not necessarily temporary. For instance, New Canaan just did a hard and fast, nope, um, we're not going to do this. They passed a ban as a zoning regulation. And if they want to revisit it at some time, time in the future, that's what they'll do at their own discretion. Um, I, I want to say, though, the majority are putting some sort of sunset on these bans. So they're um, pretty much temporary. Yeah. All right. Dominique, you're next. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for this information. I really appreciate it. Speaking to about the social equity piece, if I got that correctly, or maybe I'm making a new thread here, um, are you suggesting that if we take a little longer than, than six months, hypothetically, that then some of the folks in our community who could benefit from the social equity provision might have to then go up against um, the main pool, for lack of a better term, for their, 
their license, their their business um, license. Is that is that fair to say? Um, that's not quite the point I was trying okay. to make. So let me let me just clarify that. Um, okay. If if we have a ban in place, no one can do anything here in in the city, right? If we don't have a ban in place, then it's the, the floodgates are open and the only people who are going to show up first in the city would be those social equity applicants who get their license from the state first. So it's not like we're kicking them into a larger pool. Um, they're just in a timeline sense, they would be the first ones that start knocking at our doorstep saying, hey, guys, I got my state license. I'm ready to start my business. Um, so, so they would be the first ones that if we don't have a ban in place, there may not be much that we could do if, if the, the city is disinclined to allow these at this current time, um, they would be the first ones and we wouldn't be able to do, we wouldn't be able to stop them okay. effectively. Okay. But they may be uh, the first ones wanting to put it in a place that we don't want. That's the. Right. Correct. What we're trying to do is we're trying to decide where these things should go before people come in and just find a retail establishment, a retail space where they just move in with a business. Right. And then with regard to the, I guess, if we put a moratorium or for six to nine months, whatever it would be, um, they still are going to be given priority, these social equity uh, applicants. Is that fair to say? Yes, that is absolutely okay. correct. Um, they would get their license from the state. They just wouldn't write in on their license application. Um, we're looking at Norwalk. They, they would just okay. take that license and use it somewhere else. Okay. Okay. Or in Norwalk, if the ban would be lifted. Correct. Right. Correct. Okay. And then just two quick questions. The, the second has to do with, I assume, um, I, think, I, I think this is the case, but just for my own edification, that the state law dictates how these will look from the outside, for example, like the um, ones I've seen in Massachusetts or sometimes you drive right by them, you don't even know they're there because of the signage being so minimal. Um, is that fair to say as well? Attorney? It is, it is. Okay. The, um, right. the actual law um, and the regulations that um, DCP has passed um, sort of fleshing out the law even further, those have pretty um, stringent advertising requirements amongst amongst other things. Okay, excellent. And lastly, this could be a quick yes or no. Is, is it gonna come to our uh, inbox at some point, the regulation, like do we have to address the home grow rule that will go into effect next year or is that separate from, from our ordinance here? Yeah, that, that would be totally separate and distinct. Okay. So whatever you guys do here would not affect the right for those certain individuals to um, grow up to the certain number that, that the law sets out um, would be permissible. So, yep, that wouldn't affect that at all. Thank you very much. All right, looks Appreciate like you've got a second question. If, Dominique, are you done? I want to make sure before we ask. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, no, thanks. I just want to clarify, um, following up on Dominique's question. So do the social equity applicants have to specify in their application where they are planning on operating? Um, I, I believe they, I, I think they do, actually. I haven't actually seen the application itself. Um, so, but, but I do want to say, I, I think these applicants are going to identify um, within the application itself where they're expecting or where they might already have um, some sort of local level approval or authorization. Like I said, there are some municipalities that are allowing this. Um, so for, for applicants who are seeking to go into those municipalities, um, I think they're probably in the best um, spot to actually list a location. Um, but you know what? I, I don't want to speak out of turn. That's, a, you know, I can get back to you guys on that one if you want, but I'm not, I'm not positive on that question. 
Yeah, I think that would be very helpful because I think my sense, and I'm suspecting others as well, is that we want to be facilitating applications on social equity applicants. And so if the timeline, if our timeline is going to impact the ability of people in our city to pursue this, I think we want to know that as soon as possible um, to help us shape our own timeline. Sure. Exactly right. Right, because we do have um, a couple of committee members that have been assigned, Mr. Keegan and uh, Mr. Goldstein, are going to start the um, initial research on this um, this ordinance and get back to us about how we would want to craft what the cannabis establishment ordinance would look like in Norwalk. So um, at this time, what I'd like to do is move this to public hearing. We can leave the nine months in for the time being. We may get some information from Nick that might make us want to act faster, and we can make that amendment at the next meeting that we have, if that makes sense to everybody else. I'd like to make that motion. Great, thank you. So um, all in favor of moving this um, temporary prohibition of all cannabis establishments, which we, I don't know if we have a number for it yet. We don't have an, um, a code number. Um, all in favor? We, yeah, we don't have a code number that would probably be assigned after it was uh, sent to code. Great, okay, so all in favor, we'll um, put that on February's agenda. That's um, a unanimous um, vote. And I, now I guess I would uh, take a amendment to adjourn if anybody, I mean a motion to adjourn if anybody would like to do that. <laughs> Mr. Hoofman, you, I saw you first. Great, we're done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. All right, Good night, everyone.